Okay, is the screen being shared? Um, yes, yeah, yes, it is. Yeah. Let me move. Should I start? Yes. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for attending our session today. We are honored to have Dr. Shri, an auto rhinolaryngologist all the way from India as our guest this morning. As always, please remember that the Google form will be posted in the comments at the end. With that being said, Dr. Shri, you may start sharing your screen whenever you like. Um, I'm already sharing. Oh, oh yeah, <laughs> no worries. Is that okay? Yeah. Yes, perfect. Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Shri Karpa Rao. Uh, I'm the director and consultant ENT surgeon at Dr. Rao's ENT Group of Hospitals, Hyderabad, India. Uh, um, a little bit about myself. Uh, I hail from India and our medical system is a bit different from that in uh, US and UK. In India, we get into med school after giving our national entrance examination. And I did my med school in PS Institute of Medical Sciences, Andhra Pradesh, which is for four and a half years. And then uh, I passed out in distinction and was awarded gold medal by the then chief minister of our state who is equivalent to governor of your states. Later, I completed my one year compulsory rotational internship from Narayana Medical College, where we'll be posted in different medical and uh, surgical branches. Then I cleared my uh, national entrance examination for post-graduation and I opted for otorhinolaryngology in Pratima Institute of Medical Sciences. I cleared my exit exam and after the three years course where I stood as university topper in my state. Then I did my senior residency in ENT and head and neck surgery for one year at Gonman Koti ENT Hospital, a state-run tertiary ENT hospital at Hajbad. Then I did my fellowship in cochlear implant surgery for six months at Hinduja Hospital, Mumbai. Currently, I have my private practice and I'm the director and consultant ENT, head and neck surgeon at Dr. Rao's ENT group of hospitals, Hyderabad, India. Luckily, I practice along with my husband and father-in-law who are also ENT surgeons. So today in my presentation, uh, we will go through an introduction to otorhinolaryngology or simply ENT, a brief anatomy, uh, a brief on anatomy and physiology of uh, hearing. And I will make you walk through along with me about how to diagnose and manage a case of otosclerosis. And we will end the presentation with a short surgical video which is performed on our patient. Otorhinolaryngology is a surgical subspecialty in medicine that deals with the surgical and medical management of ear, nose, throat, and the structures related to head and neck. And that's me in my OR performing a thyroid surgery. And I love that unicorn surgical cap of mine. So what is an ENT specialist treat? An ENT surgeon can provide diagnosis and treatment in several areas of expertise, which include otology or neurotology, which deal with diseases of ear like ear discharge, swimmer's ears, hearing loss ranging from a newborn baby to elderly individual, and uh, tinnitus or ringing sounds in your ear, or uh, dizziness and balance problems, etc. It also deals with rhinology, which deal with the diseases of nose and sinuses like sinusitis, uh, nosebleed, or sometimes loss of smell, etc. And laryngology, which deals with the disorders of throat, including voice and swallowing problems. And uh, head and neck, which deal with cancerous and non-cancerous tumors in the head and neck, including the thyroid and parathyroid. Uh, like uh, thyroid carcinomas, uh, thyroid lossal cysts, or pleomorphic adenoma of the parotid glands, et cetera, and facial plastics and reconstructive surgery, which deal with uh, rhinoplasty and deviated nasal septum, with left lip and left palate, et cetera, and allergy, uh, where we provide medical management and immunotherapy in conditions like uh, seasonal or perennial allergic rhinitis, hay fever, et cetera. So it's a uh, quite vast one, right? 
So with that being said, today I'll be reviewing a case on uh, autosclerosis disease, which is the commonest cause of progressive hearing loss in uh, young adults. So before I go into what autosclerosis is, let me talk to you about how normal hearing works. Our ear is divided into three parts, the outer, middle, and the inner ear. The outer ear consists of pinna and the external articular. You can see that in the neon green thing which I marked. And the middle ear comprises of eardrum and three tiny bones, the malleus, incus, and stapes. Stapes, incidentally, the smallest bone in our uh, body. And then uh, the inner ear, which comprises of cochlea and the sense organ of hearing and the vestibular apparatus. This is a short surgical view, but this is a normal video. Uh, sound enters the outer ear canal and it vibrates the eardrum or the tympanic membrane. And this sound must travel through the middle ear space into inner ear by three middle ear bones, the malleus, the incus, and the stapes. And the stapes will then transmit the sound into the cochlea or the hearing organ. Inside the cochlea, the sound impulses are converted into electrical impulses by tiny hair cells, and these electrical impulses are transferred to the brain through the auditory nerve. And this is processed in the auditory cortex of your brain. If any of the links in this chain are disrupted, you'll be left with hearing loss. So what happens in autosclerosis? Autosclerosis or autospongiosis is a disease of the otic capsule, a bony capsule which surrounds the inner ear, uh, where a remodeled bone or abnormal bone develops around the stapes that uh, connects to the cochlea. This impedes the movement of stapes or the third middle ear bone and thus prevents the normal conduction of sound from the outer canal to the inner ear. So this autosclerosis, it typically results in conductive hearing loss as sound cannot be conducted from outer to inner ear. Sometimes bone remodeling can also extend into the inner ear or the sensory neural organ, resulting in sensory neural hearing loss or you may get uh, dizziness, tinnitus, along with conductive hearing loss. So with this a brief introduction, uh, let us get into the case presentation proper. A 35-year-old female presented to our hospital with uh, complaints of hearing loss. Now, elaborating about the hearing loss, the hearing loss was insidious in onset and was gradually progressing over the last three years. She gave birth to a baby boy two years back when she noticed worsening of her hearing loss. And she has no history of trauma, viral infections, ear discharge, ear pain, ringing sounds in the ear, or giddiness. Taking this detailed history is uh, really important to arrive at a probable diagnosis before proceeding for physical examination and investigations. For example, if this patient presents to us with sudden onset of hearing loss, then our differential diagnosis and approach to the patient will be a lot different. Most of the times, half the diagnosis will be understood from uh, the history itself. So coming to the past medical history, patient is uh, not a known case of diabetes or hypertension and does not suffer with any kind of thyroid related problems. And uh, her family history is significant as her mother had such similar problem for which she has been using hearing aids for quite some time. So we started with our routine ear, nose, throat examination. This is me in my OPD room and the one who is sitting opposite to me is not a true patient. She is my PA. She just volunteered herself for being a practice patient. We usually do not wear this amount of uh, protective gear on us, but this is just taken a few days back and we are looking so odd. And I place this video here uh, just to make you feel that you are truly shadowing an ENT surgeon and hope this helps. So this is how we do a physical examination. We put on the headlight and uh, 
We examined the Eorpinna and the surrounding area on both the sides, which appeared normal in our patient. We then examined the external artery canal and the eardrum. We can do this with an otoscope or an endoscope. Here I'm performing with my endoscopy. So what do you think we should check for while doing an otoendoscopy? Of course, we check for the ear canal and the ear drum. Um, okay. So these are some of the pictures of, from my patient's endoscopies. Uh, I have taken required consent from them before sharing these pictures with you. And taking consent for sharing any kind of details of the patient is medical legally very important. And these are pictures of the ear canal. Why don't you take a guess of the probable diseases? I'm just posting one by one. So what do you think this is? Um, I'll just uh, check. Yeah, the first one is uh, cerumen or normal wax, which is entirely blocking your ear canal and you are unable to visualize the eardrum. So in this situations, there'll be conductive hearing loss because sound cannot be transferred to the eardrum itself. And coming to the next one, what do you think this could be? Okay, I'll give you a clue. On palpation, uh, the swelling was uh, a bit harder and these are the options which I've given. It's arising from the bony wall of the external artery canal. So the answer, I'm just getting, okay. The answer would be osteoma, osteoma. Yes. And this is a bit easy, easier one. Okay, I'll give you a clue regarding this. Uh, because you are into pre-meds. Uh, here you can see some white hyphae and black spores there. So this is otomycosis or the fungus. The fungus, especially the aspergillus niger, where the uh, spores will be black in color and you have hyphae. And uh, because it is arising in the ear canal, we call it as auto, auto for ear and mycosis is for the fungal infection. So all these conditions uh, can be present in the external artery canal and they cause some amount of conductive hearing loss. So this is the reason we need to check how is the status of her ear canal uh, and the ear drum in spite of the patient telling she just has some hearing loss. So, okay, coming next. So we are past the ear canal now and we are visualizing the ear drum. We can do a similar exercise like we did in the previous slide. So what do you think these are? One, two, and three. Okay. These are different types of perforations in the ear drum. Uh, the first one is a smaller one, the middle one, uh, the second one is a bigger perforation and you can see the handle of malleus, I mean the first bone which is peeping out through the perforation or the hole. And uh, the third one is a bit different from the first and second because it is a traumatic perforation. It is caused by some trauma. And this third one is a perforation we see in most of our uh, patients who are lying about an angry wife or a husband were slapping their better half. And uh, these traumatic perforations, they have uh, blood stains around them and they have ragged edges, unlike the chronic perforations with uh, very clear cut margins. Probably uh, patients lie, but uh, the perforations do not lie. In the tympanic membrane perforations, uh, the surface area, the vibrating surface area is decreased and hence uh, uh, 
it results in uh, some amount of conductive hearing loss. And the amount of hearing loss is directly proportional to the size of the perforation. For example, a patient having a smaller perforation will have a lesser amount of hearing loss, whereas a patient who has a bigger perforation has a, a more amount of hearing loss. Okay, coming next. What do you think this could be? I'll give you options. I'll definitely give you options. Okay. So uh, the eardrum appears entirely intact, but you can see a chalky deposit formation in the posterior part of the eardrum. So what do you think this is? The answer would be tympanosclerosis. That those are the sclerotic patches which are developing in the eardrum. And these sclerotic patches causes a stiffening of the eardrum and it decreases the vibrating capacity of the eardrum, leading to hearing loss. It's not grommet, by the way. Grommet looks uh, in a different way. Uh, I didn't put a picture of the grommet. I would have probably after the presentation, I'll just post it up if possible. Okay, coming up next, what do you think this is? This is a bit difficult, but I hope you answer this. In this, you can see a reddish deposits over the eardrum. And these are called granulations. So uh, these produce continuous uh, weeping ear, continuous discharging ear, and this is called granular meringitis. Myrinx is eardrum. So because you have granulations over the eardrum, we call it as granular meringitis. Okay, oh. what do you think happened to this eardrum? This is called adesivotitis media. I know it's a bit difficult one. I'll tell you what happened here. You, you can see that the entire eardrum getting draped over the ossicles because of uh, the negative pressure formation within the middle ear. And this severely restricts the movement of uh, eardrum and it leads into conductive hearing loss. The thing which you should notice is the eardrum is entirely draped over the ossicles and the middle ear. So I'll give you one more picture. Okay, what happened to this? Do you think uh, both first and second images are the same? Even you can see a retraction uh, of your rum happening here, even in the second image, but it's definitely a bit different from this first one because it's its next stage where uh, you can see the incudostepidial joint, the joint between the second and third bone is being eroded. And uh, this is because of a severe ne negative uh, middle ear pressure which is happening and it causes pressure necrosis of the IS joint. And uh, this is called adhesivotitis media with erosion of the inguinous tepidial joint. And even this condition causes conductive hearing loss. This is a stage which is next to the first one. So coming up next, what do you think has happened to the third one? Okay. Okay, here you can see both the second bone and the third bone are disappeared, right? The second bone incus is eroded as well as stapes is eroded. So I kept it in different grades. The first grade is just retraction. The second grade is where the retraction leading to the joint erosion. And the third one is adesivotitis media itself with erosion of incus as well as stapes. And also there is a perforation happening. This we call as unsafe type of CSOM or the diagnosis would be adhesivotitis media with uh, uh, erosion of incus and stapes with a perforation. And this also leads to conductive hearing loss. So these also needs to be checked for when a patient com comes with uh, just hearing loss. Okay, so now what do you think has happened uh, 
uh, to this, yeah, I have a question here. Uh, fluid in the ear, what can cause that pressure on the eardrum? Pressure in the eardrum. Yeah, it's a negative pressure in the eardrum, uh, in the pedal ear. Uh, there'll be a tube usually called eustachian tube. Uh, I'll be telling about it later. This tube lies just behind our nose, uh, which can, which enters, which gets connected to the middle ear. So if there are any kind of obstruction within the nose or throat, uh, it causes compression over the eustachian tube causing negative effect in the middle ear. That's why we ask them to blow their nose properly. We ask them to blow their nose into the ears called valsalva manure, where we open up the middle ear. I'll be coming uh, to that in, the, in my next slide. So what do you think is uh, the endoscopic picture? I kept it, which is being posted now here. So it's fury red in color. And in this situation, you can see that the entire eardrum is intact but there are bloodstained spots and it is fury red in color and it's entirely bulged out under tension. And this condition is called acute suppurative otitis media. Otitis media, uh, otitis is infection or inflammation and media is uh, uh, within the middle ear of uh, inflammation of the middle ear and this is acute and it is full entirely filled with blood pus so this is called asoim so patients with asoim because they are, it is infected they complain of severe pain and block sensation in the ear i have the next one for you you should answer this uh, what do you think this is this is a spotter and you need to answer this okay i'll give you multiple choice questions it's not a swimmer ear because uh, in swimmer's ear, even the outer canal will be inflamed. And it's uh, not a tumor. You can see a tiny, tiny air bubbles which are creeping through the eardrum, through the transparent eardrum and the fluid is serous. Okay. Yes, most of you are answering the question. It's fluid. It's fluid. It's not a polyp. It's a fluid in the uh, middle ear called the glue ear, which is the commonest cause of hearing loss in children. And it is very, very common in children. Because once again, in children, you can see lots of tonsils or the adenoids. As I told you, there'll be a eustachian tube which connects to the middle ear. So whenever these kinds of swellings like tonsils, adenoids, or hypertrophy of the inferior turbinates or middle meatal polyps, or a gross bend in your nose causes obstruction of the eustachian tube, leading to the stagnation of fluids in the middle ear. And the next stage would be if the fluid doesn't drain off, that middle, that negative suction continues and results in adhesive otitis media. So the answer for this is glue ear. Okay, I have one more endoscopic picture posted here for you. And this is an interesting case presentation. And one of our patients uh, came to me complaining that he was hearing a mosquito flying in a, around his ear. And he wanted me to remove it on endoscopic examination. This was the presentation. Just have a look at it. I just kept it in loop mode so that you have some time to answer it. You can see, yes, there, the fluid is moving. Most of you are getting the answers, yes. yes excellent. Okay, so this is once again a glue ear or non-suppurative otitis media or serous otitis media because it is the serous fluid which is present there. And it is very common for adults to complain ringing sounds in the ear and autophony. They'll be able to hear their own voice and the block sensation when they have this fluid in the ear. And it took me some convincing on my part to make the patient understand this. And this is one more presentation. This is an endoscopic video of a patient who was complaining that uh, she has hearing loss and she was able to hear heartbeats in her ear. Yes, 
what do you think this condition is just have a look this is a spotter for you is a spotter Okay, you can see some pulsatile thing which is popping up. You could see that pulsatile thing which is popping up. Yes, most of you got it. It's uh, the next stage of uh, ASOM. In the previous slide, I've shown you a thing which was fury red, uh, where the pus was under tension. And when a stage comes, uh, when the pus is unable to tolerate, when the urine is unable to tolerate, then it, the pus just pops out and uh, we can see that pulsatile discharge. So this is ASOM converting into blue here, all right? And you could see a pinhole perforation also there, which is made because of this uh, ASOM itself. Okay, now coming back to our uh, normal practice patient, this is the otoscop autoendoscopic picture of our patient. Her right ear and left ear tympanic membrane appears like this, which are, what do you think? Is there any problem with these ear rums? They are perfectly normal. They are absolutely normal. The external artery canal is normal and the eardrum, you can see the bright cone of light which is popping out. This is how a normal eardrum looks like. And in our patient, the eardrum was like this. So now what should you have in your mind? What do you think could be the cause of hearing loss in a patient who has an intact eardrum, a perfectly normal eardrum, and a healthy external auditory canal? How do you proceed next? So uh, the common differential diagnosis of a hearing loss with an intact TM would be, uh, it could be Ossicular discontinuity, the ossicles, the term ossicles means bones, the middle ear bones are called the ossicles. The ossicular discontinuity where the attachment between the ossicles or the middle ear bones is disrupted. So that could be the cause of hearing loss or in case of ankylosis of malleus, the malleus or the first hearing bone will be fixed and it will not be mobile. Uh, yes, some of you are telling about uh, the death of hair cells, nerve damage. Excellent, excellent. That's true. That's true. That comes under sensory neural hearing loss. Okay. Oh, uh, and uh, in otosclerosis, uh, the stapes or the third middle ear bone is fixed, and even that causes conductive hearing loss. Sometimes there can be some benign or malignant growths uh, occupying the middle ear severely hampering the ossicular chain mobility and this also causes hearing loss. All this group of uh, differential diagnosis which we have, which I just posted there, uh, cause conductive hearing loss. But most of you, as most of you have said, uh, I could see the answers which you are giving. Uh, sometimes the external ear and the middle ear may be functioning normally, but the sense organ of hearing, as you were telling, called the cochlea or the auditory nerve where I just uh, mentioned earlier can be diseased, raising to sensory neural hearing loss. So there are two types of hearing loss, the conductive and sensory neural. In case of uh, uh, death of hair cells or uh, any disease to the cochlea or disease to this auditory nerve or when you have some acoustic neuromas or some tumors lying in the brain which cause compression over the auditory nerve or sometimes because of extreme noise, loud noise exposure, where there'll be rupture of the cochlear membranes, um, that uh, it manifests as sensory neural hearing loss. And in those individuals, the outer and the ear rung appears absolutely normal. So you need to differentiate whether the patient has a conductive hearing loss or a sensory neural hearing loss. Okay. So with these differential diagnosis in our mind, we perform the functional examination, which include uh, the clear clinical hearing tests. 
And the aim of this test, as I already mentioned to you, is to primarily differentiate between the conductive or the sensory neural hearing loss. And these are done with the tuning fork of uh, 5 12 hertz frequently, and they're done on both ears. And now coming to the clinical test of hearing, the first test being the Rennie test, uh, we first inform the patient about the test that we are going to perform. And then uh, we place a vibrating tuning fork first in front of their ear, and then place it on the back of their ear on the master right wall. They are advised to tell us which sounded better, the front one or the back one. If the patient tells us that she's able to hear the front one better mm -hmm. than the back, this is called Rennie positive. It implies that her air conduction is better than the bone conduction. If she tells us that she's able to hear the back one better on the mastoid board better, then it is called Rennie negative. It implies that her air conduction is decreased and has some form of conductive hearing loss. And we perform this test in uh, both the years, as I have shown you here. So in our particular patient, her both the ears were showing Rennie negative, which implies that she has a conductive hearing loss in both the ears. So now we have a list of differential diagnosis in conductive hearing loss, and the sensory neural hearing loss is chopped off. Then we proceed to the next test, the Weber's test. We place a vibrating tuning fork on the middle of the forehead as shown. And then they should be able to tell us which side it is radiating to, which side they are able to he uh, hear it better. Normally, they should be able to hear it equally or uh, it should be centralized. This is called Weber's being centralized. In case of conductive hearing loss, uh, it is lateralized to the worser hearing ear. And in case of sensory neural hearing loss, it is lateralized to the better hearing ear. So in our particular patient, Weber's test is lateralized to the left ear, indicating that she has worse conductive hearing loss in her left ear because the Rennie was negative in both the sides. So we understood that this is conductive hearing loss and Weber's is telling that she has more worse hearing of conductive hearing loss in the left ear. So then next we do a nasal endoscopy and we examine her throat also. So I could uh, see this, what about the sinus pressure? Yes, I had a question there, so I'm just coming to that. So we definitely need to check about the sinus issues and all for which we examine the nose and the throat. And uh, I think you know the reason why also. So have you ever observed when you have severe cold or uh, you may feel the ears also getting blocked when you have cold? And this is uh, because of the reason that there will be a tube which connects from behind the nose and the throat to your middle ear as explained earlier. This is called the eustachian tube. And we need to check once again whether there are any abnormal swellings in the nose or the throat. And this is the diagnostic nasal endoscopy, which is performed on a patient. On the left side, here you can see uh, the septum. The, oh, wait, let me show you. Okay. So this is the middle turbinate. This is the inferior turbinate. This side was your, your septum. And this is the nasopharynx where here you'll be getting your eustachian tubes. And we need to make sure that we do not cause any kind of injury uh, to the structures while performing this. And in this patient, both the nose and throat were normal. Of course, we check for the sinus pressures also. And then once the clinical evaluation is uh, completed, uh, we send the patient for both audiological as well as uh, radiological evaluation. Uh, the audiological evaluation includes pureton audiometry and the impedance audiometry, which are the gold standard tests for evaluating hearing. And this is done by a trained and certified audiologist. And the radiological investigations include a high resolution computed tomography scan of both the temporal bones. A pure tone audiometry is done to check the type and also the degree, the amount of hearing loss. 
In case of pure tone audiometry, pure tones are presented to each ear, both ears individually at different frequencies. So in Rini and Weber test, we check only for 512 and 256 Hertz, but in pure tone audiometry, we check for different frequencies. I'll just put it up in the next slide. So this is how we, uh, our audiologist is doing on our practice patient. Air conduction, bone conductions are checked separately and the patient is asked to lift their hand whenever they perceive the sound. Okay, then a graph is plotted by taking the pure tone frequency on x-axis and the intensity on y-axis. And this is a pure tone audiometry graph of our patient. We can notice uh, that there is significant loss of air conductions in both right and left ears, which are marked by green arrows. I hope you are able to see that. Okay. And the bone conductions are, which are marked by red arrows are good in both the ears, but there is a significant dip in bone conduction at two kilohertz frequency. And any cases of what this is called, the dip at two kilohertz. Okay, this is too much for you. So uh, this is called Karhat's notch and it is the characteristic finding in case of uh, otosclerosis. And ENT surgeon is very well trained in reading an audiogram and we'll be able to clinch a diagnosis just by looking at the pattern of the audiogram. And this dip at 2K hertz called the Karhat's notch is a very characteristic one for otosclerosis. Now, what do you think this test could be? I already mentioned the name of this test. Okay, I will play this for you. Just answer what this test is. Okay, I didn't get the answers. Okay, this test is called the impedance audiometry. This is an objective test, particularly especially useful in children. And this test helps us to find out the compliance or uh, the stiffness of the tympanic membrane or the eardrum and the ossicular system complex and also assess the function of the middle ear. I guess this is too much for you. But yeah, this test is one of the gold standard tests to know the status of the middle ear. So I just put it up there for you. It's pure tone audiometry. It's uh, impedance audiometry. Pure tone audiometry is the one which I've shown you earlier. And this is the impedance, which, may, which is mainly useful for checking the pressures in the middle ear and uh, to find out the stiffness of uh, the tympanic membrane and the ossicular system complex. Yes, uh, I'm getting impedance audiometry as the answers. That's good, that's good, that's good. Okay. In a normal healthy ear, we obtain an A-type graph. So you can see a plateau. Oh, so here yeah, the compliance of the eardrum is very good. And also the pressures which are plotted there uh, are also perfectly fine. So the middle ear pressures are maintained well. In our patient, this is our patient, uh, where the results were of A-S-type. S for stiffness, okay, the, the results were of AS type in both right and left, which implies that you could not see that plateau, right? This indicates that there's decrease in the compliance of the tympanic membrane or the eardrum, but the middle ear pressures were absolutely maintained. You can see that it's almost near zero. And this AS type graph is usually seen in Ossicular fixations, the middle ear bone fixations, or conditions like uh, 
malleus fixation or the ankylosis of the malleus, as I mentioned you earlier, the first middle-ear bone being fixed, or autosclerosis where the third, third middle-ear bone being fixed. Okay, right now we have, uh, we are just narrowing our differential diagnosis. Then we proceed for the radiological evaluation. And uh, we do a high resonance computed tomography of temporal bone, uh, which is very much useful, not only for confirmation of diagnosis of disease, but also simultaneously ruling out the differential diagnosis as we have even the ankylosis of malleus or other tympanosclerotic fixations causing that AS type of graph. So even that could be ruled out with this uh, HRCT temporal bone. It also provides information about the possible challenges we may face while performing surgery, such as overhanging facial nerve, where the facial nerve or uh, the nerve which is responsible for the smile and closing of eyes, the facial nerve. So uh, whether it is overhanging, with, whether it is coming down onto the stapes, or you have a high riding jugular bulb, or an enlarged cochlear aqueduct, etc. So finally, to summarize, uh, we have a 35-year-old female who presented to us with complaints of uh, progressive hearing loss since uh, three years, which was worsened after a childbirth. And there is no history of ear discharge or ear pain, giddiness, tinnitus or ringing sounds. And her mom had such similar hearing issues for which she has been using hearing aids. I highlighted this because uh, autosclerosis is a disease which runs uh, in a familial thing. It is not, so it is hereditary and usually it affects uh, fertile women and it aggravates during pregnancy. So all those I highlighted, I didn't want it to go deep into autosclerosis. I just wanted to focus on the, uh, his, uh, on the case history. So I just highlighted them. So you can just later go ahead and see what autosclerosis is. You can uh, know how is the histology and all. All right. So on otoscopic examination, her eardrums were normal and rest of the ENT examination was unremarkable. And uh, the pure tone audiometry reveals both right and left conductive hearing loss with a uh, dip in the bone conduction at 2K Hertz called the Gerhardt's notch and uh, her impedance audiometry showed bilateral AS type graphs and the high resolution computer tomography scan of the temporal bones suggestive of autosclerotic focus in the anterior part of oval window area. This is too much for you, so I didn't explain that for you. So probably uh, the provisional diagnosis could be autosclerosis in our situation. Okay. Uh, then what are the treatment options? Now we have a diagnosis in our mind. So how would you proceed next? So we explain the treatment options for our patients. So the first thing would be uh, for an autosclerosis, we'd be going ahead with the surgical procedure. Uh, the surgical procedure, uh, we call it as exploratory tympanotomy, where we open up the middle ear and then we do a stepidotomy and then we remove the stapes, which is not which is not being mobile, which is being fixed, and then replace with with the processes. So the procedure is called exploratory tympanotomy with a stepidotomy and prosthesis placement. So the surgical procedure is uh, explained for the patient, and most importantly, the potential benefits as well as the risk of the surgery should be explained, and they are explained for the patient. And once the patient opts for surgery, all the necessary list of uh, surgical investigations and uh, the pre-anesthetic checkup are completed and the patient is scheduled for surgery. But if uh, the patient do not want to go ahead for uh, surgery or she, has, she or he has uh, some contraindications for undergoing the surgical procedure, the next option would be going ahead and using a hearing aid or any kind of ampli amplification device. So it can not be an, as an alternative, but it could help uh, to a particular extent because it is conductive hearing loss. The first option would be going ahead with a surgical procedure only all the time in case of otosclerosis. And I'm just... 
what are some of the risks? Uh, uh, there are potential risks uh, for performing the surgical procedure. I have anyhow kept the surgical procedure also, uh, which are kept there. So when you are drilling a hole, when you are making a fenestra in the foot plate of stapes, foot plate is the part of stapes. So when you're making a fenestra in that, there are high chances if, uh, if your hand is not very stable that it may go and hit the facial nerve. So your eye and your, your mouth will be deviated, you'll land up in facial palsy. Or sometimes when you perforate it even more harder, there are chances of uh, sensory neural hearing loss, which is even more worse. And there are several complications like perilymphatic gusher or endolymphatic gushers. Um, uh, but I do not want to go in depth regarding this uh, for you. But anyhow, I kept the surgical video for you. And uh, there's one more option in the treatment uh, called medical management where uh, we uh, give sodium fluoride for our patients, but uh, it is not so useful. We usually give this, uh, as I explained you in earlier, autosclerosis where they have both conductive and sensory neural hearing loss. Um, where parts of cochlea are also involved. In such situation, we can just give a try. But as per the recent investigations and the, the recent uh, papers, they suggest that uh, there is not much improvement on using sodium fluoride. So uh, we are, uh, for the past three years, we are not giving them much. We are just focusing on the surgical procedure and going ahead with, if there are contraindications, we go ahead with the hearing aid. So uh, this is me in my OR and uh, you can see the patient. Of course, I just cover the patient because the confidentiality of patient is extremely important for us. And uh, uh, the patient is lying in a uh, lying down in supine position. And uh, we do the surgical procedure under a microscopic vision. And coming to the surgical procedure, the first step is to give a local anesthesia for the patient. So there I'm holding the pin of the patient and then injecting a local anesthesia to the patient. And then later I uh, give an incision. That's a speculum. I hold the speculum with my ha one hand and then with the Rosen's knife, I give an incision and then elevate the tympanometal flap or the skin which is present over the external artery canal. And then I elevate the eardrum. Of course, there's a small cotton ball which is kept there for hemostasis, uh, for stopping of the blood. And uh, we elevate the eardrum such that we expose the uh, middle ear space. And the next could be, okay, I have a question for you. I just wrote a question here. Can you just tell me what the structure uh, is seen now? I'm just uh, playing the video for you and this is kept under loop so that you can identify it. We, I'm giving you a clue. We enter the middle ear, we elevated the ear drum and I'm just removing. Okay, I'll give you one more clue. This is a nerve. It's not a blood vessel, this is a nerve. Okay, I love. Any guesses? Okay, that's enough of loop and replay. Uh, that's, that is the cauda tympani nerve. So it's our taste nerve, uh, which supplies uh, they sensation to our anterior two thirds of our tongue. And yeah, this lies in the middle ear itself, in our ear itself. So ENT is all about senses, right? Okay. And proceeding to the next step, um, in order to visualize uh, the stapes or the third middle ear bone better, the overhanging bone, the posterior superior wall of the external artery canal is being removed with the help of a curette. And the next step is making a fenestra or a hole in the foot plate of stapes. There you can see me uh, making a fenestra. 
So uh, I used a skeeter drill uh, to make a fenestra in the foot plate, but you can also use a laser or a simple perforator, a cold instrument for this uh, fenestration step in the foot plate. And I have a question for you here. Do you know what is the size of the fenestra or the hole which I drilled in the uh, foot plate of stapes? Just guess, just give a rough idea. You're just pre-meds. Okay, okay. This, uh, the size of this fenestra, it ranges from 0.6 millimeter to 0.8 millimeter. So it's sub-millimeter, it's less than a millimeter. So uh, uh, some of you uh, have asked me question, what are the complications of the surgical process? I told you I'll be answering here. Uh, the, when you're doing a fenestra of that size on the smallest bone of your body, your hand should be extremely stable while performing this step. Any kind of abnormal movement during this step will damage the surrounding structures and the surrounding structures are extremely crucial. The facial nerve, which is just lying about the stapes and you may lead with a, a facial palsy or uh, you may lead into sensory neural hearing loss or uh, sometimes the incus also comes out if you just nibble that and uh, there will be a perilymphatic gusher as I told you earlier. Perilymph is nothing but the CSF uh, which is present in the brain. And then uh, the next step would be, uh, okay, the next step would be measuring the length. A measuring rod is used to measure the distance between the fenestra. You can see the measuring rod being placed there to measure the distance between the fenestra, that is the hole to the incus, the a long process of the incus, which usually varies between uh, 4.25 millimeter to 4.5 millimeter. We make sure we measure the length and the processes, whichever we are going to place, we measure the length of the process also, whatever we are going to place, and then we place it. So you can see that in the next step. So this is a piston, which is, uh, this is not a grommet. This is a piston, this is a processes which is placed into the fenestra of this foot plate of stapes. And it is uh, crimped onto the incus. You can see me crimping with an alligator forceps. So if you do not measure the length of the piston or the process is whatever you are going to place. So if the length is more, once again, the patient lands up in vertigo or giddiness because you're basically puncturing the stapes and finally entering into the inner ear. So any kind of uh, pressure changes or any kind of abnormal movements like hitting it harder definitely results in what I go and sometimes very bad tinnitus, continuous ringing sensation in the ear. Patient complains that I'm able to hear better, but oh doctor, you have given me this tinnitus, which is one of the worst complications of this uh, Autosclerosis. That's the reason you need to make sure that you measure the lead properly and then place the piston accurately. And once again, with extremely stable hands. And the next step would be the incus is then disarticulated from the stapes and the stapes suprastructure is being removed. So that is your tiny, tiny bone the state is born. And I finally seal the fenestra or the hole which is made there uh, with adipose tissue or some seal that with a wind graft. This is because, uh, you know, right now the inner ear is also being opened. There is a communication. So we are just sealing that. And we just need to make sure that only the piston moves with the movement of ear drum the incus, the malleus should move, incus should move, and your prosthesis also should move. So we, we just seal the fenestra. And if you observe carefully, I preserved the taste nerve also throughout the procedure. Finally, the eardrum and uh, the 
uh, skin of the external articulum, both are replaced. I just have a question. I have a question here stating that does a piston ever need to be replaced later or does it last lifelong? By God's grace, uh, the pistons, whatever. So here I'm just sealing, uh, I replaced the eardrum and once again, I kept uh, the gel foam or the sofratuli packs such that the eardrum and the external articulum they heal normally. And coming back to the question, the piston, whatever we have placed, it should not come back. That's what, that is also a complication. So uh, some surgeons, they place once again a cartilage over that, but once again, that causes some amount of hearing loss. That's the reason this is called a uh, magic surgery in otology, because it just takes 20 minutes to half an hour of our, for, for the surgical procedure. But if done correctly, the patient will be able to hear immediately after surgery on the table itself. And this is one of the most rewarding surgery for an otologist. And as we basically restore uh, one of their senses. And uh, regarding the piston extrusion, uh, the girl who asked me is, is that, yes, there are chances of piston extrusion. That's why uh, what we do is, uh, the technique what I did here is, the cauda tympani nerve is being positioned there just above the piston. So the chances of extrusion out are very unlikely, very, very unlikely. Some, some of the surgeons, they cut the cauda for the better visual, visualization, but later after a few years over probably uh, six to 10 years, you can see the piston just popping out, just peeping through. It, it may not come out, but it, it may just get ad adhered with the eardrum. So that's the reason uh, I uh, once again replace the cauda. And if you can see in my thing, the curated bone, whichever I have removed, is also being replaced. This I have started since uh, uh, two, two years, maybe. That's it. The, the bone which is where it's removed is once again replaced. So the chances of extrusion are very, very, very less in our cases, in our scenarios. So I have a question from you that how do you ensure that your hands are stable? That's the reason uh, we have a surgical uh, chair where you can just uh, place your hands this way and you need to train your lumbricals for that because the movement should exactly be here. There should be no movement at all because you'll be dealing with a millimeter size of a surgical procedure. So you need to train. Um, that's the reason this is called magic surgery. And uh, on the live, before we do on live surgeries, uh, uh, we have to minimally get trained on the cadaver bones minimal of uh, 50 to 100 temporal bones are to be done. Luckily, I got the opportunity and I've done nearly uh, 152 temporal bones before operating on the patient. And uh, yes, we developed that skill over time. And coming to the next uh, thing, coming to the contraindications. A good surgeon is, I always feel that a good surgeon is the one who not only knows uh, when to operate, but he should also know when not to operate. A stephy surgery must not be performed in uh, the following conditions. When the person has only hearing ear, when he has only hearing ear, why do you want to take a chance? It's his precious, hear, precious ear. So uh, we usually do not operate when the per person has only one hearing ear. And uh, so that's one of the contraindications. Then when it is associated with Meniere's disease, Meniere's disease is the one where a patient has vertigo as well as uh, tinnitus and some amount of sensory neural hearing loss also. So, and uh, it'll be probably, this we call a fluctuating hearing loss rather than a normal straightforward hearing loss. So this is something which is concerned with the inner ear also. So we usually avoid surgical processes in these kinds of patients because when we operate on them, there are high chances that they may go ahead and do sensory neural hearing loss after the surgical procedure. 
So rather than lining up a patient from conductive hearing loss to sensory neural hearing loss, it is better to avoid. And that is one uh, really good contraindication. And in young children, uh, we usually avoid because you already know the uh, they tend to get recurrent new stage in tube infections and they tend to get this glue ear or ASOMs recurrent because of the adenoids and tonsils they have. So we usually avoid doing uh, in young children. So we opt for otosclerosis surgery only after uh, 18 or 19 years. But luckily this otosclerosis is very rare in children, young children, and uh, it usually manifests around uh, 25 years or so. Then it could be professional, in professional athletes and divers also, uh, we do not operate. You'll be knowing the reason why. Can I expect the answer for this? Okay, in divers, you may think in divers. So what happens when a diver goes deep into the water? You would have gone for a scuba diving where the trainer, he keeps on telling you, see, keep popping, keep popping your uh, eardrums in that way. So when you go for such extreme pressure changes, uh, there are chances that it may cause, uh, whenever you place a piston in the ear, uh, a person who has undergone otosclerosis surgery will be placing a piston and because of that extreme pressure changes, patient may land up in vertigo and uh, it may really interfere with their profession. So because of extreme pressure changes in the divers and professional athletes or uh, patients or people who frequently try uh, fly the airport crew members, of course we operate on crew members but not um, uh, very frequently. And of course, the tympanic membrane perforation, and you know the reason why, because there'll be nothing to cover over. So uh, I have, uh, this is the end of my presentation almost, and I have this for you. I have a quote. Um, if it were easy, everyone would be a doctor, and this is the best job in the world, hands down for this despite everything and because of everything and um, it may be it so it may not be very easy for us to get into medical course but i'm sure all of you will enjoy the experience tremendously once you enter into it so always dream about it study hard and fulfill your ambitions wish you all a very best and um, do i have time yes, most of you are answering oh my god you being into pre-med you are giving the answers accurately <laughs> excellent thank you so so much dr shri we feel so privileged and honored to have had you as our first international physician guest everyone make sure to check out her socials her instagram is dr shri.ent thank you guys so much for attending again um the Google form has now been posted in the comments and it's also in our Instagram bio. So please fill it out within the next 30 minutes for us to receive verification. Yeah. I have to specially thank Arian and Isis, uh, the creators of Web Shadowers, uh, for making the intercontinental shadowing possible in this uh, flawless manner. And I truly appreciate the work you guys are doing for uh, budding doctors uh, during this COVID pandemic. And thank you everyone for attending. Thank you, Thank so, you so much. much. So we loved sweet. your presentation. Yeah, it was awesome. We learned so much. And we love the videos. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone, for attending.